As a real estate agent, are you finding that a lot of your clients right now are telling you they want to wait on the election? Um, they want to wait and see what happens with the election. Let me know in the comments if that is the case for you. Because what I want to talk about in today's video is what they're really saying, what that really means, how you can capitalize on those conversations and on those situations. But more importantly, right, and this is the big one, how you can use this moment in the market. Okay, how can you, how you can use this incredible once in a lifetime moment in the market to catapult yourself to 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 this place that you that you only dream of, right? To being like a top agent in your area, you know, a top number one agent, number two, top five, top ten, top twenty agent in your MLS. So let me know in the comments right now. Comment me if you even desire to be a top agent in your market, a top 25, a top 10, a top five, uh, number one, because I was the number one agent in my entire MLS for eight years in a row. Um, I did this and I want to talk about exactly how I did this, what my methodology was because it was when I came back from losing everything in 2008 when I actually devised the plan to do that. And by 2014, I was the number one agent in my entire MLS. And I held that title for seven more years. That's what I want to talk about today because it's an even bigger, this moment, in my opinion, is, is an even bigger opportunity for real estate agents than back then. Okay, so that's what I want to get into. First, okay, first I want to talk about what does a market actually, because before we can actually put together the plan to become the top agent in our market, first we need to understand, because to, to put together the plan, that means that you're planning something for the future. Okay, that means that you're foreseeing something and then you're 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 plan you're you're acting accordingly before things happen the way you think they're going to play out so that you can capitalize. So before you do that, then we need to understand a little deeper about where we are in the market and what the market may or may not do so that we can put that plan in place to be three steps ahead of the rest of the agents in our market. That's actually what you need to be thinking about and, and should actually be the goal to be three or four or five steps ahead of the rest of the agents in your area, the only way to be the number one agent is to be three, four steps ahead of every everyone else um, at all times. Which means what? It means understanding these market cycles and where they're going, and how to how to capitalize on them, right? So I want to share with you guys some interesting information that I realized about that. Um, I mean, first off, this right now, okay, right now is the, in my opinion, is the toughest market that you're ever going to see as a real estate agent. The toughest market you're ever going to see. Why do I say that? I say that because right now we're on track to do the amount of transactions that we did in 1995. Okay, not 2008. We're lower than 2008 this year. If you can imagine a market worse than 2008 in terms of number of transactions, like the number of transactions... This year is going to be worse than 2008. That is mind boggling because 2008, I was there, was a very, very scary, worrisome time. Uh, we didn't know what was going to happen. Like it was almost, it was almost worse than COVID almost because COVID kind of came and went. 2008 was like, it linked, like we didn't know what was going to happen. Um, you know, the government bailed out the banks, but COVID, they bailed out everybody. Like they sent everybody checks. Um, so it's just a totally different world, totally different ballgame. We're going to have less transactions this year than we had that year. So the re it's not just the transactions, okay? I was thinking to my wife about this. Like, like, we have fewer transactions in 2008 with, okay, with all-time high prices, Right. So you think about in the future, in your lifetime, a market that is worse than the market that we're in right this second. OK, if you can actually statistically think about what that looks like. And when I think about what that looks like, the only thing I can imagine is if a, if a market is worse than it is right now, it would be kind of the opposite of right now in terms of over inventory and lower prices. 
Because right now we have a shortage of inventory and all-time high prices. And I think the only thing that can make this worse, because with low inventory and high prices and, and lower transactions in 2008, the only thing that could be worse if you flipped that and you had high inventory and lower prices. And in my opinion, because I went through 2008, I sold in 2008, that market would be easier to sell in than the market you're currently in. This is the hardest market I think you'll ever see to sell real estate in. Um, just because every like high prices, high interest rates, nothing to sell. You flip that around and prices are 20, 30, 40, 50% lower, like they were in 2008. You've got plenty of things to sell. It was a lot. I'm telling you right now, like it was not hard to sell property in 2008. I'm like, here's a beautiful home. It was selling for 400,000 three years ago. And now it's, you know, 250. And they're like, yeah, I take, I'll take two of those, please. <laughs> and I'll take two. It was not a difficult market. Right now is a difficult market. So understand that right off the top. Now, when you look at election years, okay, um, the number of transactions, uh, home sales in years after election years, nine out of the last 11 elections were higher. Okay, going all the way back to 78. Okay, nine out of the last 11 elections, the year after home, home uh, transactions were up. Okay, the only time, the only years that they weren't were, were 81 and 89. Okay, so so typically we have higher number of sales the year after an election year. Okay, home prices, what do home prices do? Look, they went back all the way and they couldn't find a single year, like on transactions, we went back to 78. So nine out of the last 11, you know, we were up the next year. With home prices, with home prices, they were up every single, There was they couldn't find a year after the election year that home prices weren't up. Now, that doesn't mean there can't be an exception to a rule or something can't happen or whatever. Not, we're not sitting here trying to predict anything. What, what we got, what we have to do if we want to four or five X our business it, to, and take advantage of the opportunity that's right in front of us is just realize what the probabilities are. Because what we want to put ourselves in a position of is... If we take action based on what we feel like might happen and then what we feel like might happen doesn't happen, we're still winners. It's kind of like two years ago, I said, January is going to be one of the biggest Januaries we've ever seen. You should go out and stack listings to the moon. Well, in January, it wasn't one of the biggest Januaries we've ever seen. I was wrong with that. But guess what? The agents that went out there and stacked listings, they still won, right? So, so you put yourself in a position where, okay, we're going to bet big on something happening, but in the event that that something doesn't happen, we're still winners. So we win either way, right? Even in worst case scenarios of what we think doesn't happen, we're still crushing it. That's what you need to be thinking about. And that puts your mind at ease with stressing out about, oh, well, what if this happens? It doesn't matter because you put yourself in a position to win either way. And if the market does swing the way you thought it might, then you went even bigger. See, you put yourself in a position where you either win big or you win bigger. There's no not winning. There's no losing. There's only win big and win bigger, right? Those are the only two outcomes for you. Win big or win bigger. All right. So, and when I started researching like election years and what happens with the housing market and stuff like that over the past couple of days, what I realized is that any effect that the election has on home prices and transactions and the housing market o overall, it has very little effect. Like it, it could affect it a little, but it, it, it's, it's so temporary. It just kind of comes and goes. And when you think about these big moments in, in, you know, for media and, you know, the industry and, you know, the world and uh, for social and things like that, these things that come along that seem so massive, if you really think about it, they kind of come and go and nothing really changes a whole lot. Okay. It's kind of like when everybody thought Zillow was going to um, replace real estate agents, when Amazon bought into the real estate industry, when for sale by owner.com came along, um, we've had the AI thing. And more recently, we've had this NAR settlement. What has happened since the NAR settlement? Like our business has just continued on. We had to change a few things the way we talked to talk to our clients, sign a few extra documents, and honestly, nothing has really changed. Um, I see agents closing the same amount of deals, making about the same amount of money. Um, so in some cases, more money. It's not a. It's, it's like it's like a lot of this stuff is a much ado about nothing. 
So don't try not to put too much weight on these kind of things. What you should do is 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 look at the 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 macro uh, uh, cycles, the market cycles. Okay, like two thousand eight was the last time we had a year like this. Well, that's I I. I I can I can promise you that because of what I did in 2008 is the reason why I became such a successful real estate agent. Okay, this is your opportunity. This is your 2008, but it's on steroids. Like this is way better. Okay, why do I say that? Because of the pent up demand. We didn't have the pent up demand in 2008. We did not have the pent up demand that we have right now. So when you think about the pent up demand right this second. We've got, we already had trade up sellers. We have the golden handcuffs. Okay. They want to move, but they can't. We've already have first time home buyers. We have more 30 something year olds now than we've had since the baby boomer generation. Okay. Way more. Okay. Um, we don't have as many as the baby boomer generation, but in terms of what the 30 something year olds have been for the last 20 years, we, we are, if you look at a chart, it's crazy how many more 30 something year olds we have right this second. So first time home buyers, we have the golden handcuff people, right? Now you've got people sitting around waiting on the election to happen. So that adds another group of people. You've got people that, you know, you guys know, Mortgage rates are over 7% right now, right? They got down to, to 6.2, and now they're a little over 7% right now today. And like, I mean, uh, some, like, I asked some people down in Miami, they didn't even realize that because they kind of crept back up. Like, like it was kind of like, uh, you know, real silently, like the mortgage rates just kind of crept back up um, over seven. I think a lot of people are sitting around now because of that as well. So you have interest rates higher, you got the election, and then you have the normal se- uh, yearly seasonal trends, right? We're going into the fall and the winter where it's normally slow. And so you got sellers who aren't listening right now because they want to see who what's going to happen with the election. You know, even the ones who are listing literally are getting not getting that many showings overall. Like you may have listings that are selling in a day, right? Most agents are having their listing. Everybody's kind of chilling right now. Like this is like we're days away from the election and people are just like, I'm going to wait and see what's going on. And you ask them why. And they're like, I don't know. I just want to see who I just want to see what happens. Right. They're, they're, they can't even give you a reason of why they're waiting, but they just, everybody feels like they need to see what happens here before they actually do something, right? So again, right now, the, the this is the toughest market that you'll ever see. If you're, if you're surviving right this second, you need to count your blessings and realize your business is about to explode next year, okay? But we have to understand the trends and, and actually invest in this. Let me meet everybody. All right. Mm. So when you think about markets going up and down, I want you to realize that nothing goes up before it goes down. Like it has to go down first. Even when you plant a tree, the seed goes on the ground, then the tree goes up. You build a house, they dig into the earth, they build a foundation, and then they build the house, right? My bank account had to go way down before it went way up. The market always goes down. Stock market, it goes down before it goes up, right? It's the real estate market is where, this is as bad as it gets. It has nowhere to go but up. There's nothing but but blue skies ahead, incredible opportunities, um, positive uh, uh, vibes and uh, incredible days ahead of us. I want you to know that, all right? Um, And so, what what what's gonna go up must go down first. So just it's just part of it. All right. Now, when I was back in 2008, I just want to tell you guys this quick this quick story. When I was in in 2008, I said I want to be the number one agent in my market. Okay. Why did I say that? Because the reason I said that is because I knew that if I was the number one agent in my market, I would be making well over a million dollars a year. And the goal was to make a million dollars a year, but I didn't make that the thing I was chasing. I made the thing I was chasing the thing that would create the million dollars as a byproduct. See, I, see, when I create a goal, like, like, let's just say I want to, uh, I want to get a bunch of listings. I want to have a lot of listings, tons of listings. 
Well, I, I don't need to focus on the listing. See, that's the part of the problem with agents. They're focusing on how to handle objections and talk people into listing properties to get listings. No, 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 no. No, listings are the byproduct of creating deep connections and relationships with property owners in your market. So, so when I finally realized this, I quit chasing listings and trying to get people to sign contracts and do deals with me. And I realized that's the byproduct of creating deep relationships with people. So I just focus on the deep relationships with people. And then guess what? I got a bunch of listings. Whenever I hit number one status in my MLS, I started making a million dollars a year. That was the goal, but I used the number one spot as the way to get there. So you have to figure out what your goal is and then don't make that the thing you're chasing. Find out what causes the goal and chase that, okay? So I work on byproducts. I don't work on the goal. I create the goal and then I figure out, okay, what what action actually creates that result? Okay, I'm gonna focus on that. And this is the step that a lot of agents, a lot of people, a lot of people kind of skip over. So in 2008, now, now what did I do? I realized the market was down. I realized it's relationships over transactions. I realized closings happen every day forever, no matter, you know, regardless of market conditions. I realized competition doesn't, not, not only doesn't exist, it can't exist. I realized that, um, that, that business is unlimited for each and every one of us, right? And the more that we consume in terms of getting listings and doing deals, the more production is created. Like the more opportunities uh, uh, arise when I actually get a listing. I'm not taking a listing away from everyone else. I'm creating opportunities for everyone else, right? Uh, when, a, when a first-time home buyer enters the market, that's another client in the whole client pool of the, of the, uh, of the, econ- of the local ecosystem of buyers and sellers. And the bigger that pool is, the bigger the opportunity is for everybody else. Just because I represented this first-time home buyer and you didn't, doesn't mean that that relinquishes the opportunity for you. It actually increases the opportunity for you. When I get a listing and you don't, it doesn't take that opportunity away from you. It gives you the opportunity to find a buyer for that property and, and maybe even relist that property or, 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 or maybe even help that seller buy something. You don't know if something's going to happen with that agent. They, they want to change agents. You never know what's going to happen, but you can't look at this from a pessimistic, there's only so much for everyone perspective because it, it, that's not the way that it was set up. Now, in 2008, when I said, I want to be the number one agent, listen to this. This was my plan. I said, I came in and I realized that foreclosures were everywhere. And there were these foreclosure agents that I was so envious of. Like I was so envious of these agents and they were making like 40 grand a month. I remember the title company telling me that these agents were making like 40, 50, 60,000 a month. And I was making like 40,000 in six months um, at the time. And I was like, oh my goodness, how can I get in on this? And after a little research and reaching out to a few banks and understanding how REO works and BPOs and all this stuff. I was like, I ain't going to do that. Number one, number two, all those seats are already taken. What can I do? And so that's when I started to visualize it. And I was like, okay, I got this. The foreclosure agents who don't answer their phone because they get all the listings handed to them. They're going to be out of business whenever the foreclosures go away because they're not going to have any clientele. They're not going to have any relationships built with anybody in the market because their only relationship was with the bank. And when the bank runs out of properties to sell because the market shifts the other way, they're going to be out of business. I said, but the, the, the agents that represent the buyers on these foreclosures are going to reap huge rewards later because those buyers are going to turn into sellers when the market rebounds. They're going to get a deal on the property. They're going to be happy about that. They're going to be excited about you helping them get that deal. They're going to come back to you when they want to sell it when the market rebounds in two to three years. They're going to sell and upgrade to something they really want and refer three or four people to you who actually do multiple deals and refer more people to you. I saw all this happening. I was like, bingo. All I got to do is go out here and represent as many buyers as I can on these foreclosures. And in the next three to five years, I'll be the number one agent in my entire MLS. I literally took a look at the market and it took me months of like trying to figure out, should I be a foreclosure agent? Should I do this? Should I do that? To, To realize where the opportunity was. So... I executed, I sold a bunch of foreclosures. They ended up selling, they ended up upgrading, they ended up referring me to everybody else. Of course, I continued on my path 
you know, cold calling, circle prospecting, getting listings, and continuing to build that side of it as well. Um, but, but, you know, that was my plan and it worked out exactly the way that I planned it. Now I went all in, in 2008 when literally it was about with me transactions and we ain't too far below 2008. It's about the same. It was a really rough year, but it wasn't as hard to sell because things were half off. That was the cool thing about it. Things were so discounted. That's the big difference in now and then, but. Um, the population is bigger now and there's, there, there are opportunities. There are deals closing every single day. So I had an agent tell me just before I got on the call, he's like, I made 2000 calls in the last whatever. And I have only gotten like, you know, a handful of appointments and no listings or whatever. I was like, man, listen, you cannot, you cannot base your, your, you cannot critique your, your business right now on whatever your conversion rates are right now, because everybody's waiting. It's, it's, it's fall interest rates are up. The elections are here. There's no inventory. It's a weird time. You can't base anything on the, your results on what's happening right this second. And I haven't heard back because it just happened before this call. But I was like, how many of those 2,000 people that you talked to did you create deeper relationships with? Because if it was like 50, 60 people they actually talked to, they had great relationship with, like you don't realize the seeds that you're planting. Like we reap what we sow. We don't reap when we sow, right? It, it, like you reap, you, you sow and you reap in due time, right? You got to let these things happen. It just doesn't happen overnight. Like in 2008, I went all in on this and I was number one by 2014. Six years, six years later, okay? Um, these things don't happen overnight, but if you can visualize these things and start to start to act accordingly based on the things that you see and put yourself in a position where you either win big or you win bigger, then you don't got nothing to worry about and you know you're at least going to win big, worst case scenario. <laughs> so I knew if I represent all those buyers, worst case scenario, I'd represent a bunch of buyers, right? On these half off prices. Okay. So that was kind of how I formulate it. Now, what, what would I be doing in this market? Like, what should your plan be? And then I want to talk about these um, prospects that we have that are, that are holding off for the election and stuff. Um, and by the way, I'm doing a 2025 business planning session in December. 2025 business planning session. I don't have the exact date yet, but if you want to get notified on that, uh, just and you're not getting my text messages, I'll put it here in the chat. 251-312-8844. Just text me there and add yourself to my community uh, text so you can get notified whenever I do trainings and different things because I'm bringing it whenever I do this business planning session in December for next year. I'm excited about next year. Or some big things that are going to happen. Because when you go from a 3.8 million existing home sale year to a 4.2, 4.3, 4.5 million, which is what's going to happen next year, that, that like you, you're going to feel like the earth just blew up, like an atomic bomb just hit the market. Like you're going to have so much, so many deals happening because we've gotten used to and accustomed to the current market. So when it flips the other way, uh, you're going to be busy as can be, especially if you've been doing what you need to do. So what do you need to do? You need to realize the trade up seller situation, the first time home buyer situation. You need to realize that the feds are going to drop the rates a couple more times expected this year or several times next year. Now realize the fed rates not connected to the mortgage rate. And a lot of this mortgage rate stuff is already priced into the feds lowering the rates because we see it coming a mile away. However, it is going to affect it. All right, it's not just going to not affect it at all. And with mortgage rates going back to seven, there now there's still some there's now there's some even more breathing room for them to come back down. I'd love to see them get under six at some point in the first um, first half of the year next year. That would be crazy uh, for the market. But nevertheless, we can't control the rates. The rates are going to have a lot to do with 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 how next year goes. But I believe that when the elect after the election hits. I think between November 4th, 5th and, and December, the end of the year, I think we're going to see inventory hit the market. I think we're going to see inventory hit the market. You should, hopefully you've been doing everything you can to build as many relationships with property owners, right? All year long, and, and it's not too late to start, but all year long, so that when that rush comes, you're the one they're calling. 
right? You're the one they're calling to list their properties. Well, you know, if somebody wants to buy something, hopefully it's somebody that you've created a relationship with where when that happens, they call you. This is the name of the game. It's to build as many relationships as you can with people in the market so that when the market turns around, they all come to you. If you sit around and say, what's the point? Because it's slow. Nobody's doing anything. Everybody's waiting an election. Why, what's the bother? Why should I make calls? Why should I make videos? Why should I prospect? Why should I follow up? Nobody's doing anything. That's the wrong attitude. You're going to be an average agent. That's what average agents do, right? But top producers, top one percenters, people that are one number one agents in their market, they take the slow market as an opportunity to expand their influence so that when the next rush comes, everybody comes to them. Right, it's all about expanding your influence. So you got to realize that next year is going to be a banger, and you need to put yourself in a position right this second uh, to go all in with it because we're going to see better inventory. Uh, I think I think rates coming down will actually create inventory as well, and we're going to see people getting off the fence in terms of first time home buyers, etc. Because when rates get down to six, you're that's going to be the average. People are going to be locking in rates under five. You're going to see people locking their rates under five. And if you get a, if you get a, if you get a buy down at that, I mean, at six, and you're going to see people with rates at four, right? You may even see a little bit under four in some of these rate buy downs. So it's going to be very, very interesting. And next year, like there's just nowhere the market can go, but up from here, you just got to realize that. Um, I had a guy text me, another, another agent text me just before I went live here. He said he had a hundred thousand dollar commission, and the buyers backed out last minute because of the election. They were just like they're nervous. A hundred thousand dollar commission, okay? Backed out election, got nervous, cold feet. They want to see what happens. They walked away. Mm. A lot of weird things happening right now. You can't judge your business based on what's going on right this second. Now, when a prospect tells you that I, um, when a prospect tells you that. They want to wait on the election. What are they really saying? Like, put in the comments. What do you What do you think that they're really telling you uh, when they tell you they're going to wait on the election and let's see what happens? That kind of thing. Um, they're not ready. I'm scared. Uncertainty. Nervous. I tell you what I think it is, and I've dealt I've dealt with this a lot. Um, I think they're just blowing smoke. So I think prospects are really good at making real estate agents go away. And they're really good at identifying what's what they need to say to make real estate agents go away. So like the most common one, the most general one is, is I'm gonna, I'll, I'll sell in six months. You know, I might sell in six months, call me back then. And the agent just gets off the phone and never calls them ever again. And they know that. They know that. Um, now it's, now it's, now we're going to wait and see what happens with the election. Knowing good, good and well, they're not, they are not interested in anything. So when this happens and you're encountering people like this, right? Because like, think about it. If every single person that tells you that, which is every prospect right now, if every single one of them were actually going to do something after the election, like every single person, every single home would, would switch hands after the election, right? Um, most of them are blowing smoke. Some of them are serious. So it's your job to figure out who's who, right? By asking questions. If somebody were to tell me, hey, I, I'm i waiting on the election, I'd be like, oh, okay, cool. Well, like, have you, like, are, have you thought about like what you're going to do after the election? Does it matter who wins the election? I would start to ask these type of questions so that I can start digging into, is this person actually serious about doing something? Or they just tell me what I, what they what they think I want to hear to get me off the phone and get me out of here, right? And so, as I dig into that and I learn if they're blowing smoke or if they actually want to do something, now now I can actually, based on that, actually help them. It doesn't matter. Like if I realize that they're blowing smoke, great. Like I'm not here to do a deal. I'm here to build a deep connection with as many people as I can so that they call me when they get ready to do something. I'm gonna, I'm gonna reel them back in with my weekly email. They're gonna come back to me. I'm not worried about that. I'm not worried about trying to get people to do stuff. I know people are gonna do things and I know whatever my current 
conversion rate is right now. I don't need to judge my business based on that. I need to, here's what I need to base my, here's what I need to judge my business on right this second. I need to judge my business on it out of how many people I talk to, how many of those that I deeply connect with. That's, that, that's my conversion rate. So if I talk to 10 people, and, and, and I have five great conversations with people. We have a good understanding. I got them to open up to me about what their real estate goals are in the future, no matter how far out they are. And we just had a great talk. They gave me their contact information, said it's okay to stay in touch. Boom. Like I am doing my job. It doesn't matter to me if we do a deal today or not. I'm going to run into people that do want to do deals, but my current conversion rate is going to be low based on the current market. But guess what? That's going to change next year. I told somebody that I told somebody that today and they were like, oh, well, that that's no good. I was like, what's no good that that um, don't judge your business on current conversion rate. I was like, wait a minute. Like what I'm telling you is that your current conversion rate is is, is not going to be what your current what your conversion rate is going to be next year. It's going to be better. Isn't that a good thing that you're that you're not the, that that your current conversion. If your current conversion rate was what it's going to be forever, you'd be in trouble. How is what I'm telling you a bad thing? Like, this is a good thing that whatever the conversion rate is right now is not, is going to be temporary. And, and it's going to get better and better and better as time goes on. And we get away from the election. We get away from higher interest rates. And we get away from, you know, lower inventory and, and things of that nature. Things are only going to get better from here. And that's what this video is about. I want to give you guys hope. That if you're struggling, if you're feeling like nothing's working, I'm here to tell you it is working. You just don't, you, you, your definition of results needs to change is what I'm telling you. Your definition of results is a closed deal, money in my account and all those things. It needs to be that I connect with people, right? The relationship with, with people in your market is worth way more than money. You can make, you can make a million dollars plus off one relationship. Right over the course of twenty years, you can make a. I've made a million dollar plus off one relationship over the course of my career. Several, several different relationships, um, and you're definitely going to make tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands off of many, many relationships. Referrals, repeat business, referrals of referrals of referrals of referrals of referrals. Okay, it's a snowball, guys. It's a snowball. Okay, so your client tells you that they're going to wait on the election. Okay, great. Tell me more about that. What are you going to do after the election? Right? Get them talking about what they actually want to do. Put them on the spot. Put them on the spot. Make them tell you that they're not they're not really that serious, right? Get to the bottom of it. Don't just get out of the conversation. Don't just play on the surface. Go as deep as possible as you can with every single prospect. So you know exactly what they're looking to do. How can you help them? How can you help them if you don't understand what they're thinking, what they're really trying to do, what they're trying to accomplish, why they're trying to accomplish it? How can you help them? You can't. Uh, and to me, this is called professionalism, like asking the tougher questions. See, when you start asking those tougher questions, they're going to differentiate you. They're going to be like, wow, this agent is the agent. No other agent asked me any of this stuff. They didn't ask me any of these things, any of these deep questions, trying to really understand me and what I'm thinking and what I got going on. They didn't ask me any of this stuff, but this agent did, right? They're, they're going to look at you as more of a professional than these other agents that are just playing on the surface, right? And listen, don't just do this now. Do this forever. They, this is a good place to start if you've never went deep with your clients. But like start now. Use this as an excuse to do this now. But they continue to do this from here on out. This is the key, guys. This is the secret here. This is the secret sauce, to actually building a massive business because when these people, when they when they start when they connect with you at a super deep level, they ain't going nowhere. Like they are going to be loyal to you for the rest of their life. There's three tiers of your database. The smallest tier, the smallest piece of your database are those who are loyal for life. This is the smallest group within your database. All right, this is your smallest group, okay? Say you've got a database of like 2,000 people, all right? You may have like 50, let's just say. Let's just, you might have like 30 or 40 of those 2,000 people who are like gonna be loyal for life. They just love you. They're, they, they're like, they, they just, they praise you. They just tell everybody about you. Other agents reach out to them and they're like, okay, now I'm gonna deal with Ricky. That's the smallest group in your database. The next largest group are people that like you and they might use you, but they might use another agent. 
All right, They're, I call these the wishy-washies. They might use you, and they do use you, but they might use another agent on the next deal. And then they might come back to you, right? Those people are that's that's the middle that's the mid range size group in your database. And then the largest group in your database, people getting your weekly email, seeing you on social, you talk to them, they act like they love you. They will never, ever, ever use you because they either, A, don't like you and are scared to tell you, or they have another agent they're loyal to. That's going to be the largest uh, sector of your database. There's three There's three tiers. It's shaped like a triangle. Smallest, loyal for life. Second largest, wishy washers. And, and, the, and the biggest are the people that just will not use you at all. So when you're talking to these people and you put them in your database, just realize they might be loyal for life. They might use me. They may not. They may never use me, but it doesn't really matter because as the database grows, you're essentially growing each sector. And you just want to continue to grow each sector and have those loyal for lifers, those wishy-washy. Like, I love the wishy-washy ones, man, because like I'll see we'll use another agent. I know what I'm dealing with. They come back to me. I'm like, yeah, let's do a deal. I know you might go use an agent on the next deal. I don't care. Right? It's their choice. I'm just trying to help them do whatever it is they're trying to do, if that makes sense. So realize these people could be blowing smoke. They might not be. Go deep with them. Right? Get them in your database. Get the weekly email pumping. All right? And, and create those lifelong relationships and build your business to the moon. All right? I think this is the biggest uh, opportunity for real estate agents right now. I hope this video blesses you. Uh, and I'll see you guys on the next video. Until then, bye for now.